I know, I know, how could I be so predictable? All right, this is another best of 2021 movies list, okay? Everyone's doing it, I'm jumping on that train as well, but shut up, I do it every year, okay? Cause I don't know, it's a bit fun, it wraps up the year and it shows off how good my taste is. Look, that being said, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna hate my taste based on this video, but hey, that's kind of the fun of these sorts of lists, right? As long as we're not all writing the same stuff, that's the fun of it, we're all different and stuff. So just by the way, I'm gonna have a top 20 this time, rather than just a 10 just because I liked a lot of them quite a bit didn't want to get rid of any of them so it's 20 okay coming in at number 20 is a Norwegian film called The Trip which is about a husband and wife who are secretly planning to kill each other on a weekend getaway when intruders come along and kind of ruin these plans and things get even bloodier than they were planning for it to and man this is a horror comedy that is quite fun and silly and particularly brutal in some scenes as well one scene in particular that I actually think took it a little bit too far and went way too hard on just the brutality and ickiness and just like I don't want this to be in there just cut that right out of there but apart from that this is a very fun film that I really enjoyed quite a lot obviously since it's on my top 20 list right I definitely recommend it to anyone who is into the horror comedy genre but if you're not well I, I wouldn't this isn't one that's gonna like transition you over into being a fan of that genre it's yeah it's pretty obvious what it's going for, but it does what it's going for well, if that makes any sense. Coming in at number 19 is another kind of horror comedy that's called Superhost, which is also similar to The Trip because it's also about staying at like a weekend getaway place. This time it's an Airbnb where these influencers who are YouTubers like me are going there to review it on their channel. And it was kind of really interesting to watch in, in that regard because like they were YouTubers. They weren't just generic social media people and influencers that they made fun of like complete dumbasses. No, there was like a respectful tone to showing who these people were. As it showed the ins and outs of being a YouTuber in relatable ways. It also had some inaccuracies, which was funny to notice from somebody like me. But like, I just really liked watching people who were YouTubers in movies. I'd really like to see more of that kind of thing. Obviously I can relate to that. And it was just, yeah, it was just kind of interesting to watch like how they were creating their content and stuff. But apart from that, the rest of the plot revolves around the host of this Airbnb who will do anything to get a good rating, anything. And things get a bit dark there and it's very, very fun. Then coming in at number 18 is The Mitchells vs. The Machines, which is just a cute little animated film produced by Phil Lord and Chris Miller. So it's got that fast paced, action and comedy in there that just I really love kind of with the identity of uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs that they also did very much like that this one's about a family where they're I don't know like road tripping or whatever and then like an apocalypse breaks out and whatever with robots and stuff it's silly it's but it's good I like it it's a lot of fun got a lot of energy to it then 17 is the night house which is just a, a spook em up haunted house type of thing but it's a bit more artfully done than your generic type of you know, just spooky house movie or whatever. This is very well done. It's about a woman who's going through trauma because her husband died. And that's about all I want to say. And that's about all that I like can understand in my in my memory right now. <laughs> like, I remember this one got a little bit complicated when it came to certain elements. And I really liked it about it, but I don't remember all the details. <laughs> but yeah, the night houses are fantastic. And yeah, obviously, right? Then 16 is Nobody, which is a movie starring Bob Odenkirk. And he is basically the John Wick for dads or whatever. Maybe the John Wick is already the John Wick for dads. But Bob Odenkirk takes kind of a more grounded approach where when the action scenes come up he's getting beaten down he's he's kind of out of touch here a little bit he's not in his prime and it really makes this movie enjoyable to watch especially in a fight that takes place on a bus that's kind of early on in this movie that is just one of the best action scenes I've seen this year by far really enjoy this movie but it is a bit of a dumb shoot em up type of thing. So if that's not your thing, I understand it doesn't get that deep, but it does get deeper than I was expecting it to. Then coming in at number 15 is the map of tiny perfect things, which is kind of like this teenage cutesy rom-com type of movie, but it also has this um, time travel element in there. Not time travel so much, but like a Groundhog Day element in there. They're living the same day over and over. And yeah, it's, it's a rom-com that's Groundhog Day and it's, but it's more modern and I like it a lot. There's not 
not too much else to say about it. If that sounds interesting to you, you'll probably like it. I think it's adorable. <laughs> then coming in at number 14 is Don't Look Up, which is a new movie that's just gotten released on Netflix now, I believe, or will be soon. Depends on when this video goes up. <laughs> and this is a new Adam McKay movie that is all about making fun of dumbasses, basically. Making fun of people who will not listen, will not use logic, just want to be selfish. And, and yeah, it, it's about problematic people on all fronts from the media from the from the public from all aspects of life and everything and it is about these two scientists who have figured out that a comet is headed earth's way that it's going to be catastrophic it's going to destroy the entire world everybody is going to die if this comet hits and there are things that they can do about it and hopefully save the day but People don't want to listen. There are non-believers out there. There are people who like want to try and get monetary value out of it somehow and don't care that everybody is going to die for whatever reason. It's just a hilarious movie that hits a little too close to home. <laughs> but I, I I really enjoy this one. Then number 13 is kind of a controversial one, but it's Don't Breathe 2. Look, I know people don't really like this movie and I understand why. It kind of, kind of redeems a horrible man who literally like sexually assaults people in the previous film he's clearly the villain but i do think that what i need to point out here is that it really doesn't turn him into the hero really he just has a mutual goal with us which is helping this little girl in this movie but he's still a bad guy he's still a villain and he's still somebody who we're like no that dude is like sickening i hope he achieves what he's trying to do at this very moment but after that dude can get fucked <laughs> and i really like that aspect of this movie where like it's a it's a movie full of people who are not good like you don't agree with anybody everybody is kind of a scumbag i've mentioned this in many movies that i've reviewed where i love that aspect to a lot of movies because it gives you it gives you this sense of morality where you don't quite know where to sit you're somewhere in the middle at first and then you watch things play out and it's like well shit who's the good guy i don't think it's exploitive of who he is i don't think it's trying to be like nah this guy's all right I really don't. Don't Breathe 2 is just as intense as the first one and I think it's a really effective thriller film. Then number 12 is The Guilty and this is another kind of controversial one because this is an unnecessary remake of a foreign film. I don't remember what country that was. I think it was Swedish but I might be making that up. But this is a movie about like a police call operator person like who answers the call when you call triple zero here in Australia 911 in America or whatever else you call in whatever country you're from. And the whole movie takes place in this worker's office you never leave that place and you never see the other actors that he's talking to on the phone which is really interesting the issue with this movie is that it it does not need to exist because yeah. it is a remake of the exact same film it really doesn't change things up very much and so i'm kind of against its very existence if it wasn't so good <laughs> see jake dylan hall is in this movie right and he's my favorite actor and he made me feel things for this main character more so than the original did. And I don't feel good about saying that because I think the original is fantastic and definitely like is the one that obviously made up the story and made all of the elements come along. But you bring Jake Gyllenhaal in there and he just escalates it that little bit much more for me. Not just because I like him, but because I think he's phenomenal in this movie. It's amazing. Anyway, the movie is about him um, trying to help a woman who was called 911 in this case. Uh, asking for help because she's been kidnapped. Yeah, and, and it plays out from there and you'll see, you'll see what else comes from there. But yeah, I, I, I think this one is fantastic. Had me on the edge of my seat and all that stuff. Even though I already knew where it was going because I'd seen the original. Then number 11 is Gunpowder Milkshake, which if you watch my channel, you know I loved this movie. This is a movie about um, a few different women uh, who are basically John Wicks in their own right, basically. And it's just this very badass movie about, yeah, it's a John Wick type of movie, okay? I don't really need to explain things. There's mafia stuff in there and whatever. What you do need to know, though, is that there is this one scene where the main character gets, like, injected with whatever it's called that makes your arms, like, go to sleep, and she has to, like, fight them without the autonomy of her hands. And it's brilliant. It's so inventive. There's also this really badass fight in, like, a bowling alley. Really love that. It's just awesome, okay? Uh, 
I really enjoyed this movie. Then number 10, and I had to do it, I couldn't not include this, it's Spiral, okay? When I had first seen it, I was actually kind of disappointed. I had really high expectations for this one because I'm a big Saw fan. And I was like, yeah, it was good, but it didn't touch the previous films for me. But in retrospect, I really like some of the decisions that it made, and I really do think it's earned its place. Though I don't think it's perfect, and I would have done some things differently if it were me. I mean, I say that like I'm a brilliant filmmaker, and I could have done any better which is total bullshit but regardless <laughs> i think that spiral really actually is a worthy saw film and it like it, it did well with the traps and all that stuff it was pretty brutal it did well with some of the themes when it came to the main character the thing it didn't do so well for me was that it was quite predictable which is something that i would never call any of the saw films and for that i really do have to say that i think this is my least favorite saw film but i do still like it it's still a saw film you know the next up is wrong turn the 2021 remake reboot whatever we call it which is based on a franchise which is pretty much a friday the 13th ripoff where teenagers go to the woods and whatever and get killed by these crazy cannibal people. But this movie takes a wildly different direction from the previous films and I respect the hell out of it for it. This movie is actually a lot more intelligent than I was expecting going in. I thought it was just going to be some popcorn horror crap. Just yeah, yeah, whatever. This is going to be disposable. It's going to be fun, but like I'm not going to remember it. I'm not going to care about it very much, but I ended up really enjoying this and I rewatched this with my parents because I wanted to show them that, look, horror can be good, okay? <laughs> They're not the biggest horror fans. Fans. Um, and even they did quite enjoy this one. I think that they will deny that now because they probably forgot that they liked it at this point, but <laughs> they did, I promise you. Uh, yeah, Wrong Turn takes more of a culty direction here, and it's really another one kind of like some of the ones I've mentioned before where you don't know who to side with here because there is kind of this argument about who is right in particular situations, and it's clear as to who is right and who we side with, but the other... The, the opposing side makes some good points, I guess, if you want to twist it in a certain way. Maybe, I don't, I don't agree with the villains of this movie, which they definitively are. They are the villains. But I can see where they're coming from, which is always something that makes a villain good, you know? I, I, and I think that this movie definitely has a leg up on that when it comes to the previous Wrong Turn films. It's very good. Then coming in at number 8 is Tick Tick Boom, which is another movie that came to Netflix recently. It stars Andrew Garfield as John Larson, who is this like composer and writer of the guy who made the musical Rent, which is not something I'm really familiar with if I'm being honest. But this is all about his life leading up to that in the 90s. And it's... It's not one that I had like high hopes for. I thought it seemed maybe interesting. I really like Andrew Garfield. I don't quite like musicals though. So I didn't go into this with like the highest expectations ever. I thought I was going to like it. But, and then I ended up loving it. Tick Tick Boom is like, I I was moved by Tick Tick Boom, man. Like it, it made me fear for, for my for, for aging. <laughs> it made me think about productivity in my own art and how I related very hard to the main character where it felt like time was always ticking by and he just wanted to, you know, get his work out there and he wanted to be seen as a respected artist. And I really appreciated that aspect to it, which is very much what this is about. It's also about the balance of relationships on top of all that stuff. And it's also very much about like, you know, Broadway and musicals and all that stuff too, which isn't something that I'm necessarily that familiar with, but it was interesting watching those things sort of all come together in a way, like coming from my perspective where I don't really know anything about Broadway musicals or whatever, like it was interesting watching the guy create this stuff, if that makes any sense, and the desperation and the obsession and how dedicated he was to this particular play, musical, whatever you call it, that he's writing in this film, which isn't Rent, it's one before that. Uh, you never actually get to Rent, but it, it's like from a few years prior to that. I really like this movie a lot. I highly recommend this movie, even to people who don't like musicals. If you're anywhere near my age, I'm 25, just by the way, if you're anywhere near 25 or so, or a bit older, maybe a bit younger, I think that you'll find a lot to appreciate here. If you're older, you might too, but I'm just saying, it hit me in particular, it just, it came out at the right time, I'm the right age, and I liked it. Then number seven is The Father. This is a very prestigious film that I think technically came out in 2020 in some places, but it didn't for me. It didn't come out till February here, so I don't care if this doesn't count for you, it does for me. I couldn't have possibly seen this in 2020 unless I pirated it and 
that's not what I did. I went to cinemas to see it, okay? So, the father tells the story of a old man with dementia, basically. And we start to see from his perspective how that sort of thing works. And it's scary. It's, like, kind of terrifying. And it's very tragic. This is a very depressing film. It's very slow. It's not going to work for a lot of people. But it really made me just feel bad for this main character and his family members as well. Who didn't quite know how to interact with him properly. And, like, there were all these very interesting moments where, like, things would just skip in time from his perspective where like like he's just in his house in a moment right and his daughter's in the room and she's speaking to him then she leaves the room and comes back out and she's like 10 years older or played by a different actor or whatever and it's like he's just all over the place and it's very interesting and it really kind of taught me a little bit about like dementia and it made me fear it that much more if I'm being honest but I also think that this is a really important film that like respects the characters um, it's we're not making fun of him or anything we're just we feel very bad for him and like it's so tragic because we know it's too late there's no going back and I think that that is a really sad aspect to this movie that I, I appreciate that it was going for that um, and yeah this is definitely like one of those awards type of films it was definitely going for that so yeah it's one of those movies that probably a lot of people won't like just because it is people talking in a room and that's about it but this is exactly the kind of movie that I like, to be honest. I think that The Father is absolutely easily one of the best on this list. If it's not my absolute favourite, I do think it's one of the, like, objective best, if that makes any sense. Then coming in at number six is Edgar Wright's latest film, Last Night in Soho, which is like this weird time travel, dreamy, Elm Street horror movie that really, really worked for me about a girl who keeps going back into the 60s in her dreams. She meets this certain character who mirrors who she wants to be and there's just this whole parallel there and things start to get a bit darker as we learn about the the deep underground when it comes to the entertainment industry in the 60s and the nostalgic glasses start to wear off and things start to get a bit scary and spooky. This is a very very highly intelligent film that's edited really well because it's Edgar Wright and it's beautiful man like just look at this damn Look at the poster alone, actually, to be honest. It's, it's great. Now, honorable mentions, okay? So uh, this is kind of a cheat because I'm adding a few in here. I know I said it's the top 20, but technically it's the top 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 26. What are you going to do about it? This is my video. <laughs> so first up for the honorable mentions is Antlers, which is a creature feature that is very effective. And it has Jesse Plemons in it. I love Jesse Plemons. Then there is VHS 94, which I think is by far the best VHS film. I do think that it fails a little bit just because of the final segment in this film, which really didn't work for me and let the whole thing down a little bit. But I did still highly enjoy this film, and it had easily one of the most creative horror segments and short films that I've seen in not just this year, but in many recent years, to be honest. Um, it's, it's, it's awesome. Then there is Pig with Nicolas Cage trying to get his pig back. It's kind of like the antithesis to John Wick where he's getting revenge, but it's a bit more talky than action-y. And it's awesome. This is a really popular one among like the cinephiles and stuff that I interact with online. And I think that they are all very right about what they're saying when it comes to this movie being awesome. It wasn't my absolute fave. It didn't quite crack the top 20, but it's one that definitely deserves to. And if it's on anybody else's lists, I respect it. <laughs> and I understand why. Then there's Venom 2, which is dumb. <laughs> Venom 2 is stupid, okay? But I, I enjoy it. It's just this weird, like, kind of rom-com sort of thing between Eddie and Venom. And I don't know, man. Carnage is in this one. I enjoy it. Whatever. Then there is Cruella, which I'm kind of ashamed to say because this is a movie that should not work, but absolutely does for me. I don't even care about, like, the nostalgia to it. I don't care about the music. That's not really what attracts me to this film. I don't really care about fashion. That's not what attracts me to this film. I don't know. I, I don't know what does. This is like a two and a half hour movie about a woman trying to make it in the fashion industry, which sounds like it wouldn't be for me. But for some reason, I really like it. This is basically The Devil Wears Prada mixed with Joker. And I like it. I like it. I'm not proud of it, but I like it. Then there is Saint Maud, which I think is technically not only a 2020 film, but actually a 2019 film. Technically, I think it came out in 2019 for some people, but I'm pretty sure here in Australia, didn't come out till this year. I'm not confident about that though. <laughs> this is a movie that is very highly metaphorical and it's kind of like this weird religious horror type of movie which is another one that doesn't sound like it would be particularly for me but for some reason it really works. As it approaches this character who is really genuinely I think trying to do good but is in that approach 
actually damaging the people around her and herself in certain ways. It's very much about like blind faith and it's it's a very interesting film. It's it's much like um, the movie Mother with Jennifer Lawrence, if you've seen that. I think if you like that movie, you'll probably like this, but it's definitely a hard one to recommend. It definitely won't work for a lot of people. It's like one of those ones that it could be very hit or miss. And I wasn't actually expecting to really like this one that much, but I really did. This would have cracked it into my top 20 if I was confident about the release date, but I've looked it up and like some say 2019, some say 2020, and uh, I don't know. If it showed up in a film festival somewhere, like that usually counts. Counts, and I don't count that because it showed up in a film festival in Australia at the end of 2019 But it never came out in cinemas that I could have gone to why would I count that as a 2019 film or a 2020 film? I don't know. I'm confused about when this movie came out. Leave me alone. It's just an honorable mention Okay, and now the top five finally we are at the top five These are my favorite movies of the year, which you already know because you were watching this video Why would I say that? I don't need to explain that to you. What are you an idiot? Statistically, there's probably some, but... Anyway, number five is Malignant. Malignant, again, is another movie, much like a lot of movies I've already mentioned, that will absolutely not work for a lot of people, and I know for a fact doesn't work for a lot of people. I think a lot of people go into this movie with the wrong mindset, where they're expecting it to be either just straight, like horror and then they get disappointed when it goes in some twisted silly ways or it's people who make fun of it and think it's dumb and just be like no this is like no no i don't like it and i'm like you know what no it's good it's good shut up <laughs> And that's all I'm gonna say about it, okay? James Wan can do absolutely no wrong cinematically, I'm just saying. And I think that the the way that this movie goes in its third act and everything doesn't wreck the film. It absolutely makes this film. I'm not gonna say any other details about it, but I think that this is one of the most inventive horror movies that I've seen in recent years. And I think that it is easily the most fun. And it's one that takes things way over the top, but on purpose. It knows what it is. It knows what it's doing. And this is not a stupid movie. Far from it. Then coming in at number four is Malcolm and Marie, which is a movie that I made a couple videos on at the very start of this year. This came out in like the very start of January, so some people I'm sure got to see this in 2020, but I didn't. It's a 2021 film. Malcolm and Marie is basically another version of Marriage Story. It is all about a couple and their fight throughout just one night. We never leave the house, we are just with them the entire time. As they've just come home from the husband's film premiere of his first like movie debut. He's like a director, he's a new time filmmaker, and it's very much a movie that is critiquing critics and talking about how movies get critiqued and reviewed and all that kind of stuff and about the frustration that can come with that and cracking into the industry and I really like that aspect to it but the main kind of focus is definitely the argument between the two main characters and they both make good points they're both right they're both wrong in certain ways and I really like that aspect to it very much like a marriage story very much like other films like that where it's just a couple arguing for the whole film um, this is a movie that stars Zendaya and John David Washington and I think they did absolutely amazingly in this film they, they have such high energy here that I really really respect and I think that they are honestly two of like the best performances I've seen this year not that acting is usually the thing that I'm like yes I know all about that I'm pretty dumb when it comes to acting I, I'm pretty easy to buy into things like when I'm watching a horror movie I know a lot of people watch horror movies and they're like oh it's cheesy acting I don't believe him for a second and I'm like really uh, I don't know I believed it <laughs> <laughs> but hey, still, regardless, Malcolm and Marie, if you ask me, is amazing and has great performances. Then number three is Knit Ram, which is a movie I saw quite recently about a man who did one of Australia's biggest mass shootings in Tasmania. It's a very dark film. It's one that you will not enjoy watching, but I think is definitely important to watch if that makes any sense i highly respect this film but this is another one that's quite controversial to be honest and like maybe shouldn't exist i feel like in some ways it is disrespectful and i feel like in some ways it is exploitive but in a lot of other ways i think it really matters seeing the main character's perspective seeing how things went and seeing how australia used to be and how it's changed since the event that this movie is based on it's a very complicated film that i wouldn't recommend to many people i don't think that this will work for many people. I think it will offend people. I think it will be boring to others. I think it just... I just wouldn't recommend this to many people. But Knit Ram is honestly one that I will never forget. And it's one that I've already watched twice. And I only saw it for the first time like a month ago maybe. I already rewatched this one to show my parents. I do that regularly. Um, but yeah. 
it, it's good. Then number two, this is the movie that I had to see before making this video, and that is Spider-Man No Way Home. This movie is honestly absolutely amazing, and since it's brand new, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give things away, but my God, No Way Home is easily my favorite Tom Holland Spider-Man film. And it's honestly one of my favorite Spider-Man films in general, up there with Spider-Man 2 and Into the Spider-Verse. And in my opinion, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which I think is fucking great. I, I, I know people don't like it, but I do. <laughs> but anyway, No Way Home really will... It'll make a lot of fans happy, okay? If I were a rich man... Then number one, and this is another one that's gonna be maybe kind of controversial just because of the release date, okay? But it's Promising Young Woman. Promising Young Woman is easily my favorite movie that I've seen in probably the past few years. I think that it is absolute cinematic perfection. Fiction. But a lot of people are going to say, don't put this out there, you had your best 2021 movies because this is technically a 2020 movie. A lot of people in other countries like America and stuff got to see this in 2020. We didn't, okay? It didn't come out till January here and I'd already made my best of 2020 list at that point. So this movie couldn't have made it into that list and I don't want to not say it in this year's list. You know what I mean? It, it earned it and it didn't come out till 2021 for me. So it, it counts. This is a problem every single year. I always have to defend myself and explain myself. For me, it's a 2021 film. Promise Promising Young Woman is a movie that very much um, uses the whole Me Too movement and comments on that, but it is also a movie that like isn't afraid to have a bit of fun as well. It doesn't take itself dreadfully seriously. And I really enjoy that aspect too. Like this is an entertaining film, despite it being about a very serious subject matter. And it definitely takes the theme seriously when it gets deep and dark into it. But I also just have to say like the main character here is very very enjoyable and entertaining and respectable too. As she kind of sacrifices her time and dedicates herself to basically bringing this form of justice to certain men, certain types of men who will try to manipulate women in certain situations. In this editing here, I wanted to include one more little detail about that. It's not just men that she blames. She blames women as well. Like, she blames just the people who are to blame, the people who don't help or the people who are the perpetrators. She blames the people who are part of the problem. And I really appreciate that. She doesn't single anybody out. She doesn't discriminate. And like, I really like that aspect to this film because she's not killing people. This isn't like this horror movie where she's like slitting dudes throats left, right and center. She's literally just trying to fix the world and teach people their wrongs. And honestly, it probably won't work. That's the thing that is also really tragic about this movie. I don't think that one person can make that big difference that she's trying to do, but I highly respect that she's trying to make that change. Does that make any sense? Um, I think that this is easily one of the best directed films I've seen this year. And I just, I really enjoy it. It's another one full of morally complicated characters. I, I don't know how to feel about some of the characters after having seen the film. And this is definitely one that I'm going to rewatch multiple, multiple times. I even actually regret not making a video about this movie when I first watched it. But I don't know. It was already late. It had been out in other places when I first saw it. And I'm like, it's late. No one's going to care. No one's going to watch it. And so I didn't make one, but I regret that. I wish I did at the time, like when it was fresh in my mind and I was like, I'd seen it for the first time and I had all these thoughts about it, but I imagine I will rewatch this at some point, probably within, you know, probably soon at some point, and I may make a video on it if anyone's interested to see that. Let me know. And that's all. Promising Young Woman is my favorite movie of 2021, even if it counts as a 2020 movie for some people, for me it doesn't. Those are the best movies of 2021, and you can't argue with me because it's just my stupid subjective opinion, so ha! Got you there. And that's all I gotta say. Um, Yep, cool. Let me know if you agree, disagree, all that stuff. Tell me what your favorites were and everything. Interact with me. Give me some comments and stuff so more people see the video and everything. That's how it works. Like it. Do the things. You know the things. Okay, I'm gonna go. Goodbye.